You know, when I tell you that I'm going to be speaking about spirituality at work, some of you might feel a little bit dubious about the whole thing. Are we really going to go all mystic Maggie about it? Are we going to put the woo into work? Spirituality at work for so long has been a bit of a no-no, hasn't it? Because for so long, spirituality equals religion, and it's too sensitive, too difficult a topic to address in the workplace. Yet there is now so much research in academia to support spirituality and its relevance to well-being, its relevance to physical and mental health, that we've absolutely got to wake up to it and pay attention to it. The research shows that spirituality helps decrease our heart rate, helps us manage stress, helps us treat anxiety and depression, boosts immune functioning, even delays the onset of dementia. So many good things. It improves wound healing times, the amount of time we take to get over surgery. In the workplace, it helps decrease absenteeism, helps to increase team cohesion, helps to stop or, or reduce staff turnover, all sorts of good stuff. We can no longer ignore it. So in reality, certainly spirituality is deeply personal. But it's not a private thing. Spirituality is a matter of public health. You see, the problem is for too long, we've been thinking of spirituality as just about religion. And it's very hard for us to see outside of that lens. Once we're taught one way of looking at things, we never ask to see it a different way. In an interesting experiment some time ago, American researchers took, a little bit cruel study, but uh, um, American researchers took two groups of kittens and they put one, in, uh, one group inside a container that had no horizontal lines and they lived there for the first couple of weeks of their life. They were even fed by people in black clothing with only vertical lines. And in the other container was a group of kittens who were raised for the first couple of weeks of their life with no vertical lines. And they saw no vertical lines for those first couple of weeks of their lives. Now, when they came to take those kittens out of those containers, the kittens more or less went about their lives as normal. Except that the kittens who could, had never seen a horizontal line were never able to jump on, onto the seat of a chair because they could never recognize the horizontal seat. Alternatively, on the other hand, the group who had never seen the vertical lines could go and curl up on the seat of the chair, but they kept banging into the legs of the chairs because they had never seen vertical lines, and so now they could no longer ever see vertical lines for the rest of their lives. We're a bit the same way. Even if those kittens could talk, they wouldn't ask to, be see, to see horizontal lines or vertical lines because they didn't know what they were missing. And it's a bit the same with us, with spirituality at work. We are creatures of habit. I remember giving a three-day workshop some time ago in London to mental health professionals on mindfulness. And on the first day, we were talking about listening. And that evening, we all went off to our hotels and our homes. And the next day, a woman stood up in, in, in the group and said, do you know something? I went home last night and I walked into the kitchen where my husband was emptying the dishwasher and putting the, the stuff into the cupboard. And so when I walked into the kitchen, he turned around and he said, hi, love, how was your day? How was the course? And she said, in that moment, I realized that had I been emptying the dishwasher, I would have just kept going, multitasking and listened to him through the back of my head. But she said, the frightening thing is, I have studied for years to be a professional listener. I'm a therapist. But she placed her listening skills at work and did not associate them with home. And I think a lot of us can relate to that feeling. The lens we live in and we look at in our Western life is one of busyness at work, one of do, do, do all the time. It's very atomistic. It's kind of like the next thing we need to do, the next thing we need to do, the next fire we need to put out, the next crisis we need to tackle. 
It's very atomized, never looking at the bigger picture, but just the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. We value busyness. It's a bit like living life through the tunnel of a drinking straw. It's just the tiny focus on the next thing, the next challenge that, that, we, need to, that we need to battle. That's such a sad way of looking at life and not a useful way of looking at life. But this is our Western culture. If we do bring spirituality into our lives, we tend to look at it a bit like a pie chart, don't we? It's like a slice for hobbies, a slice for fitness, a slice for family, a slice for work, and maybe a slice for spirituality. But they don't intersect. We go maybe to the yoga mat, to church, the synagogue, the mountaintop, whatever it might be to experience our spirituality. Or maybe we have spirituality on the kind of like the births, deaths and marriages, and that's our only sense of spirituality. The hatch, match and dispatch approach to spirituality, as we call it. But it doesn't permeate the rest of those slices of the pie. Now, I meet so many people who are doing all the best things that they can in terms of looking after their physical health, their sleep, their exercise, their fitness, their family time, their switch-off time, their mental health, all the things that they're, they're trying to do as best they can. And yet they're still feeling disillusioned. They don't feel like anything's wrong with them physically, mentally. They're just feeling unfulfilled, a bit blah with life. But that is because they and we have never been told that we have spiritual or existential needs as well as our physical and health needs that perhaps underpin the physical and health needs. We've never been told that. And that's what we need to be told in this day and age. We need to be opened up to the importance of our existential concerns, our ultimate concerns. And that's what spirituality does. It begins to connect this mundane stuff of our lives, the daily tasks and chores, the daily doings, with the bigger picture of what we want for our lives, the values that we want to live by, the things that are really important to us, and what we want to be able to look back at, at the end of our lives and say, yes, I embodied that in my life. I did well. But how often are we taught that? Rarely. So rarely do we actually get a chance to do that, to hook the meaning in the mundane into the bigger picture of life and the stuff that really matters to us. Instead, we're constantly firefighting all the time. Now, COVID is most certainly, and the, uh, and the environmental catastrophe, has certainly woken us up a little bit. And even before this, Abraham Maslow in his famous hierarchy of needs, he talked about this. He talked about first we need to fulfill the basic stuff, all the stuff about food, safety, um, a roof over our heads, water, and all of those kind of stuff just to keep us surviving. After that, we get to do the more self-esteem things, and then we go up to the peak of self-actualization. It's a very famous pyramid of self-development and needs. But Maslow died quite young. He died before he had time to update his pyramid with the work that he was doing later in his life, where he found that his pyramid needed to be updated with another level that came after self-actualization. And that pyramid, and that, that stage he called self-transcendence, where the pyramid almost opened like a volcano, and we were suddenly not about me, myself, and I, and improving ourselves, but actually about the other. Others, the environment, society, and perhaps for some, the divine. Spirituality can be many things. It doesn't have to be faith in a higher power. It can be just relationship between ourselves and relation to the others or to society or to the environment or whatever it might be. There are many, many different types of atheistic, humanistic, ecological and all sorts of types of spirituality. But Abraham Maslow never got to write more about this. But now with COVID and the environmental catastrophe around us, we have that opportunity to review things because that is absolutely an existential crisis. Absolutely it is. And the great resignation, as, as this kind of sweep of resignations has been dubbed across the globe, where people are actually, since COVID lockdowns, are actually kind of reviewing 
what's important to them and what they want their, from their jobs and what they want their lives to stand for. That is, again, an existential review. And companies that were for so long preaching there's no I in team have suddenly seen that there's an I in exit because there's always a uniqueness to each of us, a really important uniqueness that needs to be heard, needs to be seen. And that is something that we need to realise, to hook people into the bigger picture and their place in the great jigsaw of life. Where you know the where jigsaw, where if there's one piece missing, it isn't complete. That's what life is without each of us. Now in the academic research, we have also identified a number of spiritual disorders, spiritual distresses in the workplace. There's moral injury, spiritual dissonance, goal violation, and various different other ones. Viktor Frankl talked about the meaning and how finding a sense of purpose and meaning in the concentration camps of World War II helped him to survive those horrific experiences that he went through. And he talked about this existential vacuum that happens in our lives when we're not told that we must meet these existential or spiritual needs. He talked about that. In mainland Europe, an ex-CEO and other high-ranking executives of a company were jailed a number of years ago for causing, among other things, moral distress, a very spiritual term, moral distress, leading to the suicides of a number of ex-employees. This language is coming. It's it's coming down the tracks into the workplace and we need to be ready to embrace it as a part of good health. Now we tend to look upon things that are meaningful as if they have to be, you know, we have to go off to the third world, which is of course meaningful to help people. We need the shiny, meaningful jobs. But what's really important is to find meaning in the daily tasks so that our workplace becomes a practice ground, a bit like going to the gym for our spirituality. We have to go and do the reps. That's what we want work to be, a place where we can do the reps to build our spiritual selves and our spiritual lives so that we find meaning in the mundane, tiny aspects of what we do. You know, some time ago, I was, it was one evening, and I, I'd been out for a run, and I threw my hoodie down the couch, and I hopped into the car, and I went out just to get some stuff for the, for the next morning's breakfast or whatever. And I was driving along quite a dark and lonely road and I noticed this woman slightly crouched over. And as I was driving along, my headlights caught what I thought was glass. And I thought, golly, she's dropped her shopping or, you know, her phone or something. But she's alone. And I thought maybe she's trying to get up, but she's, you know, she's alone there. And so I kind of did a U-turn and I tried, found a place to park. And I shouted back to her and I said, are you okay? And she said, yeah, yeah, fine, thanks. And I went on up to her and I got, until I got right beside her. And sure enough, she was surrounded by glass. And she was using these shards of glass to self-harm on her own at the side of a dark road. At the end of the night, I was dropping her home to, a, to stay with a friend. And I felt really maternal to her. I wanted to give her a big hug, but it was COVID. It wasn't appropriate. It mightn't have been welcome. And so I took her arms and I just said, remember you are precious. And I left. And the next morning, her friend rang me and said, thank you for everything last night. And she specifically wanted me to thank you for telling her that she was precious. It really sank in with her and meant a lot to her. And a little while later on in that day, I was telling my, my sister about this story, and she said, but Sue, that's what mum always said to us. You're so precious. She was speaking through you. She was coming through you. Now, we had lost our mum just a little bit before that, and that was incredibly comforting for me. And it's something that still comforts me in my grief to this day. And I'm forever grateful to that girl who said to me just the simple act of thanks in all her vulnerability, the simple act of thanking me for something. Of course, it was a privilege and it was meaningful for me to help her, of course it was. But what she probably doesn't realize is just how much power she had to give me meaning and to give me comfort in my grief, 
even at her most vulnerable moment. And what she probably has, doesn't also realise is that the hoodie that I cast aside was this one. It was a template I was working with. The hoodie says, even strangers care. Now certainly, in the corporate world, we're getting better at bringing an aspect of spirituality into our lives. There's corporate social responsibility that we talk about, and we, we do sponsored walks for charity, and we help to donate more, and we're, we're better at recycling and supporting the environment and that kind of thing. We've got these nods. The UN talks about decent work. And beyond GDP is a global movement to actually begin to assess national um, progress in terms that aren't just financial, broader than financial progress. So we're getting somewhere. But the future of spirituality work will be much, much bigger than these small little nods to spirituality or existential health at work. They will, it will become part and parcel of the future of work. We will begin to mobilize our spiritual capital. We will begin to recruit and keep employees based on shared values and principles. Compassion will replace politeness. We'll honour humility. We will look and not place the burden of stress management on this person who's already suffering, but actually look to ourselves to say, are we causing stress to other people? We'll talk about responsibility as well as rights. And we'll promote people who promote and raise the people around us in service of other people, what we call servant leadership. These are the ways, <clears throat> these are the ways that we can improve and bring spirituality into the workplace. Now, some of you might be thinking, that's all very well, Susanna, but is any work going to get done in this lovely utopia? Sure it will. Because again, we're going to make the mundane, the everyday repetitive tasks more meaningful and to connect people with the bigger picture. We're going to look at everybody we meet as part of that great jigsaw, the bigger plan of something outside of what we can see with our physical um, eyes. We are going to begin to bring spirituality and that existential life into the workplace so that we begin to learn to recognize spiritual distresses. The woman who actually wants to stay at home with her children but is also considers herself a feminist and wrongly believes that these are contradictory beliefs. The parent who's struggling with burnout because he or she doesn't realize that as well as family time, we need me time to listen to the quiet, still inner voice. The team leader who's struggling to get any kind of sense of cohesion within a group with lots of different ages in it. Because he or she doesn't realize that our needs, our existential needs, they sway, they change, they vary throughout the lifespan. And a young person will have different needs and different focus than an older person. And the company that repeatedly loses its top talent to midlife crises when people decide to leave the company to find meaning elsewhere, because meaning isn't being found in their company. This, it isn't being structured to have a self-transcendent dimension to work. These are the kind of things where we will educate ourselves and begin to expand the workplace, to really grow the workplace. The time has come to no longer be shy about spirituality of all kinds at work. The research shows that it's really, really important to our well-being, a fundamental part of well-being and well wellness at work. We have to stop throwing the baby out with the bathwater and reintroduce the spiritual dimension of ourselves into the workplace. We have to fight the tide of anxiety, depression, burnout and suicide. And most of all, we need to let everybody know that we are part of something bigger and that even strangers care. Thank you.